Well, we're continuing our series of messages called Dark Horses, and throughout this series of messages, we've been looking at biblical characters in Scripture, biblical characters in Scripture that some people would describe as a dark horse. No, we're not going to give a sermon on Revelation and the horses that can be found in the end times. Sorry, that's a different sermon for a different day. But today we're looking at the most unlikely characters that God chose to use to change the world. And that's a theme that happens over and over and over again. You know, we look at the Bible heroes in Scripture and we think, of course God used them because look what they were able to do. But at one point in their life, they felt like nobodies. They felt like the underdog. They felt like the least likely person that should be picked to do the miracle that God has called them to do. And so we've defined, and if we haven't, let me define it today, what a dark horse actually is. A dark horse is this, a little known person, unlikely to succeed, who ultimately accomplishes great things. And the reality is God just doesn't do that in Scripture, but God does this today. God chooses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God chooses people who are probably going to get picked last at dodgeball, like that kind of mindset, going to get picked last to do this amazing miracle in humans' eyes. Yet that's the person that God picks to do something extraordinary through. A couple of weeks ago, we closed out a sermon series leaning into the idea that each and every one of us has a calling on our life. And the reality is that's still true today. I know it wouldn't go away in just a few weeks, but each and every one of you in the room, I want you to know God has plans for you. He has dreams for you. He's giving you opportunities. And then on top of it, he's giving you a calling on your life. I believe that God wants to do something big through and around you. He wants to do something big through and around you, not just in North Mobile, but here at Wilson Avenue. Also, if you're a regular attender here, especially if you're a member here, God's got a calling on your life to come be part of something bigger than just you. Now, the churchy answer is if I sat down with someone and said, hey, do you believe that like, God's got plans for people? like, absolutely, Brother Chris. Do you believe that God can work big through people's lives? Absolutely, Brother Chris. Yet, what do we do? Do you know, across America today, if you look at any given church, and ours isn't that different, there are people who are faithful, faithful, and serve, and get involved, and help push forward the mission of Jesus every week. And then there's another crowd. There's another crowd. They believe in Jesus. They might even pray to Jesus. They might attend regular, but they're not involved. They feel like they're not contributing to the mission of Jesus. And so right up front, we're going to talk about some things today that's going to make a few of you a little uncomfortable. But I promise as your pastor, I'm never going to shy away from topics that are hard for us to wrestle with because I think it's important that someone says the quiet thing out loud. Scripture talks about this calling that's put on our life. And God wants to do big things in and through you. And so if he's going to do big things in and through you, we've got to get involved. You've got to start living for Jesus. And so I'm going to give you the first three message points right away up front because they're a little awkward to say out loud. They're a little uncomfortable to say out loud. And we're going to kind of wrestle with this talk. We're going to have a little bit of arm wrestling emotionally going on with the message. And so I'm going to give you the three points right up quick. And then we're going to unpack those points for the remaining time that we have together. And it might feel a little awkward at times. It might feel a little, I don't know if I like what pastor's saying, but trust me, at the end of the talk, you'll probably agree with where I'm coming from. And so the first thing that I want to talk to you about is about our excuses. Our excuses hold us back from allowing God to use us. Excuses is actually going to be the dominant thing that we talk about this morning, okay? We all have excuses that go through our mind and go through our hearts and go through us Whenever we feel that God's putting a calling on our life, whenever we feel God's telling us to go do something, what happens? Naturally, we start coming up with reasons why I don't want to do this, why I shouldn't do this, why God's got to get someone else. Clearly, I don't know enough about Scripture to go talk to that guy about God. Clearly, I don't have enough time to go get involved in that ministry. Clearly, I don't have enough energy 
left at the end of the day to get involved and help those people. Clearly, I don't know if my marriage is good enough to go across the street and pray for the other couple that's going through a hard time. Like, we come up with a lot of excuses why we shouldn't get involved when we feel God's prompting us to go do something profound. And a calling on our life, what we got to understand, it's not really optional. Those are things that God's telling you to go do. Now, there are times where we have opportunities, and when God presents an opportunity, yes, that's going to be more optional. But then a calling, a calling is not as optional. And if you don't believe me, go read Jonah and the whale, right? He learned real quick that the calling is not optional, that when God tells us to do something, he wants us to do it. Now, that might feel a little heavy because you're thinking, what if I fail? And I think that's really where all of our excuses start to come from, isn't it? Because we're afraid of failure. And so, like, I've got to make up some kind of reason why I can't do that for God so that way I don't disappoint God when I blow it. And so I'm going to come up with a laundry list of reasons that convince me and might convince other people why I should sit this one out. And that way, if I disappoint God, I'm just disappointing God on the front end, not the back end, because we're afraid of the consequence of like hurting someone or not getting the job done. Don't worry. Let's put a pin in that for a moment. We're going to come back to that part of the conversation in a second. But here's what you need to know about your excuses, because your excuses are dangerous. Excuses are tools to, uh, that are tools that are used to build a life of nothingness. Now, here's what this means. When you use an excuse, it's usually to get out of something, right? When you're younger and you're a young adult, maybe when you're single and friends are going out and you don't want to go out with that friend group, you make up an excuse why you can't go out and you do something else. And what happens? You miss out on that opportunity to spend time with those people. When it comes to God and you make an excuse for the plans and the calling that he has for your life and we choose not to engage in it, when I say it builds a life of nothingness is what else you're choosing over God doesn't even compare to the amazing miracles that God wants to work through and around you. You are robbing yourself of an amazing future of changing the world for the better when we choose to do what I want to do versus what God wants to do. And it builds a life of nothingness compared to how amazing God wants to build your life to be. And here's the thing that we all need to wrestle with when we're talking about a calling being put on our life. It really comes down to this. It's possible to be a Christian and at the end of your life realize you wasted it here on earth. You can have a living encounter with a living God that changes everything about your trajectory long-term in eternity. You can have a Jesus moment where he washes your sins white as snow, right? He forgives us for any wrongs, any hurts, any habits. He heals us of those hurts, habits, and hang-ups, right? He could do some major victories in your life. And you could attend church weekly, which I think is good, don't hear me wrong. And you could pray daily, which I think is good, don't hear me wrong. And you could read your Bible daily, which I think is good, don't hear me wrong. You could do all those things and get to the end of your life and realize you wasted it. What does that even mean? How? I did the motions. I went to church. I prayed. I read my scripture. I tried to cut the sin out of my life. What do you mean I wasted my life? You see, the thing about Christianity is God loved you so much that he died on the cross for you, but he didn't just die on the cross for only you. Your relationship with Jesus is a very personal thing, but it was never created to be a private thing. And it's easy for us to look at our life and say, well, uh, I checked the box, I got saved, like I'm going to heaven one day, I'm good, and yet never check the box that my life had a significant impact on other people's lives. I never baptize someone. I never help someone cross the line of faith and say yes to Jesus. I never really spoke someone with someone about Jesus to help grow their faith. It's really easy for us as Christians to kind of just go through the motions of faith, get saved and just kind of sit in our church pew and watch the world pass on by. And I'm going to tell you today, if you've done that, that's okay, because Jesus is a God of forgiveness and grace And so don't feel beat up, but this is your turning point. 
this is an opportunity for you to say, okay, God, I got it. I hear you crystal clear. I've got to get involved. I've got to listen to the calling that you've put on my life. And so today, we're going to talk about our next biblical character when it comes to the Dark Horse series. And we're going to talk about a biblical character that's probably on the top 10 list of coolest Bible characters. In fact, most of you who came to faith as a Christian, like when you were a kid, how many of you got saved as a kid? Okay, like half the room. You know this Bible character because we teach about him early on in kids' ministry. But before God did amazing things through him, did you know that he felt like a nobody? He had a laundry list of excuses when God told him what he wanted to do through him. He came at excuse after excuse after excuse. The person we're going to talk about today is Moses. I'm assuming that everybody who just raised their hand that said they got saved as a kid knows who Moses is. And if for some reason you're new to Christianity and you don't know who Moses is, he's the guy in Scripture, and you've probably seen it in movies, who parts the Red Sea and saves the nation of Israel from Egypt that were being held slaves in Egypt and helps them find freedom in Jesus Christ. Well, not Jesus, but freedom, the habit. <laughs> freedom in God and are on their way to the promised land and are getting out of Egypt, right? Moses did incredible things, incredible miracles. But at one point, Moses had less than confidence. At one point, Moses felt his shortcomings were just too big for him to do what God wanted to do. And so we're going to pick up this section of scripture in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. Here's what it says. During the days, during those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery. They cried out for help. Their cry for the rescue from slavery came up to God. And so what we need to understand here is we have a nation of people who are living in Egypt. And one king left and died, and the next king came, and somewhere over the history of time, people forgot about the miracle that the God of the Israelites did in their country and saved them. And somehow, some way, that big group of people were captured and oppressed as slaves, which made Israel even more wealthy. Israel was already, or not Israel, uh, Egypt was already a wealthy, wealthy nation. Pharaoh, which is the king, was probably the most powerful man on earth at that time, and he just got more powerful because for the last 40 years, at this point in scripture, for the last 40 years, the Israelites had been slaves. And I don't know about you, but I just came back from Savannah, Georgia, and I learned all about slavery. And it taught me a thing or two. Here's one thing I learned. When you have people oppressed and you don't pay them a paycheck for the work they're doing, you make major money. And that was what was happening with the Pharaoh. He was oppressing a group of people, and he wasn't paying them anything. They were getting richer and richer and richer treating them harshly. And so the people of Egypt were like, ah! The Israelites were like, ah, help us, God, free us. They knew that God had called their people to not be this way. They knew that God could save their people. And so here we are. They're crying out to God, and God calls Moses to do a miracle in their life. And Moses is not really sure that God's got the right guy. Exodus chapter 3, verse 10 says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, which is the king of Egypt. I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. The children of Israel out of Egypt. God's calling Moses to free the Israelites. Come with me. Let's do this work. I am calling you to go to Egypt to free my people. And Moses is like, whoa. You do know I'm just like a rando guy, God, right? Like, I don't have leadership skills. Like, you sure you got the right guy? Like, me? Are you sure? Thing about excuses is we really kind of start them in our childhood. 
Like, I have three little boys, and my, I have an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a six-year-old, and they are awesome at excuses. Sometimes they will tell me why they were physically punching each other, and they almost got me halfway convinced that they were in the right. I know logically in my mind, no, violence is not good, but I'm like, you know, you were up to something. He did that to you? They are geniuses at it communicating an excuse. It's something that we craft as humans early on in life, and we carry it on into our adulthood. And so we start coming up with excuses. Moses started coming up with excuses, shortcomings, why he couldn't follow God to do this amazing work that he wanted to do. And we do the same thing. When God calls you to do something a little uncomfortable, when God calls you to step out in faith, I know I've came up with excuses and ignored God in my life. And my guess is you could find a time in your life where you didn't rise to the occasion. You didn't follow the calling that God put on your life in that moment. Let's check out what happens in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? That word, that phrase, who am I? Such a a loaded phrase. And I know that when we make excuses why we don't want to follow God, when he's calling us to do something big, that's probably the first one that we say, right? God, who am I to do that? And it really comes out of how we look at ourselves. You see, Moses' first excuse of why he didn't want to follow God Why he couldn't follow God really was an identity crisis. He had an identity issue. He felt like he was a nobody and that he can't do this. I can't do what you're calling me to do, God. I'm a nobody. And I think the problem when we do this, because we can relate in this way, I think the reason we do this is because we look at ourselves with human eyes. Like we look at ourselves with human eyes and we're able to size ourselves up. We're able to know what our shortcomings are, what we're good at, and what we really cannot be good at. We know our fears, we know our insecurities, and we can look at ourselves and be like, I'm not all that in a bag of chips. Like, no. Like, I know I can't do what God's calling me to do this. And Moses is sitting here thinking, God, I don't have the ability. I don't have the skill set. I can't do that. that. That's like a calling way above me. And I know you're God, and you, this is on your plate, and you've got to handle it but I think you got the wrong guy. And we have said that to God also because we judge ourselves with human eyes. But you know how God looks at you? God looks at you with Holy Spirit eyes, okay? God looks at you with Holy Spirit eyes. And when he looks at you, he sees someone that he loves. He sees someone that he went to the cross for. He sees someone that he wants a direct relationship with. He sees someone, if you've come to faith, that he dwells within. He sees someone, sure, with brokenness and shortcomings, but he says, I can mend the gaps. I can fill the gaps. I can overcome where you fall short. And what I see is tons of potential because what you are is a person following Jesus with the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And it's the Holy Spirit that wants to do the good work in and through you. It really has nothing to do, really, with our own ability. It has more to do with us being available to God and being willing to let God walk through us. Now, don't get me wrong. We should do our part. We should try to study. We should try to be a good Christian. We should try to grow in our skill sets. But at the end of the day, the calling that's put on your life is more about what God wants to do through you than what he thinks you're able to do. If you were able to do it on your own, I don't know if it would be a calling. I think that God calls us to step out in faith because it's us stepping out into the unknown. It's us trying to see if God's going to deliver us through this. And maybe it doesn't go down the way you think it will. Maybe you think if God's in it, it shouldn't be awkward. It shouldn't be hard. It should be amazing. And it's not. You're like, that was the most awkward moment of my life. And that's okay. God was still doing what he wanted to do in that moment while you were following him. See, you're more of a vessel. You're more of a conduit for the Holy Spirit to work through. 
than it is about your skills and ability when it comes to following him and following the calling that he put on your life. And I could see this with Moses going, who am I? Who am I? Because Moses is probably thinking like, God, you're telling me to go in front of the most powerful king on earth. Not only that, the richest country, the richest king on earth. And you're telling me to tell this rich king, hey, I want to take that nation, not 10 slaves, not 100 slaves, not 1,000 slaves, but a nation of slaves. Uh, God's telling me to tell you to let those slaves go. You want me to tell that to the most powerful man on earth, the guy that can say off with his head and off that head goes? That's who you're calling me to do? God, do you realize I don't have the leadership chops? I don't have the fluent speech? Like, are you, are you sure you want to do that through me? Because I'm not sure about my own abilities. And Moses doesn't realize it yet, that God is the one who wants to work through you that it's really not all about your skill sets, that God will cover the gaps. And so again, the first first, uh, excuse that Moses gives is an identity issue excuse. I'm a nobody. I can't do this. And it's really because he looks at himself with man eyes, not with Holy Spirit eyes. Again, God looks at you differently. God sees tons of potential. And then Moses leans into his next excuse in Exodus 3.13. Well, If I tell the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they'll ask me, well, what's his name? And what should I say to them? See, Moses was afraid that he's going to go tell the people of Israel that their God is telling him to lead them out of Egypt. And they're going to be like, well, if you're truly following our God, let us quiz you on the information that you should know about our God. And he let his second excuse be an insecurity excuse. That's his second excuse. I'm too insecure to follow that calling, God. I'm not qualified to call to finish this calling. I'm scared that they might ask me a question and I don't have the answer. Well, buckle up, because I'm about to reveal to you something that most of you already know. Your pastor does not have the answer to everything. Okay, early on in following Jesus, when I was a young adult and I recommitted my life to Jesus, I was like, you know, that young, excited Jesus zeal. And you wanted everybody to come in contact with Jesus. The only problem was I didn't know much about him. You know, I had the Sunday school kids lessons down. But, you know, what if they asked me the hard questions? Like, why do bad things happen? Why does God let bad things happen? If God is around us all the time, why did he let that happen to me? Oof, that's a heavy one, right? It took me time to figure out how to answer that question. That is one question I could answer, but it'll distract from today's message. But there's times where you could get choked up and be like, I'm afraid that if I go talk to that person about Jesus, that if I open up and choose to be a small group leader this year and host a small group, someone might come to group and stump me in front of the crowd, or I might let them down because I won't have every answer that's okay. Because here's the problem. I was so afraid of that. A lot of the time, I didn't talk to people about Jesus early on in my walk. And then God led me to one way or another become a pastor and called me to be on staff at a church. And over the years, I've been a groups pastor and a recovery pastor and an executive pastor. And now I'm a lead pastor. And it doesn't get better with that fear of insecurity of not knowing enough when you become a pastor. Sure, I I went to school and I have a master's in divinity and I just have to finish my dissertation for my doctoral program. That's all in ministry. But I still don't have the answer to every question. And now when you become a pastor, you're like a paid Christian, right? You're a professional. I'm a professional Christian. And I still don't have every answer. It's a, you know, and not only that, I'm a professional Christian. People go to the pastor for answers right? They want to know. I learned early on, I had one of two choices in my ministry career. I can come to church, the building, because I believe the church is people. I could come to the church building where my office is, and I could shut the door, and I could open up theology books and listen to lectures and continue to go to school and try to just educate myself forever in hopes that I could remember enough information to one day 
be able to answer any question that someone has tossed at me. I could do that, but I realized if I do that, I would be a lousy pastor because I probably wouldn't meet with many people because I wouldn't be willing to. I'd be afraid to open the door and chat. I probably wouldn't build the ministry, launch new ministries, recruit new leaders, develop leaders, and deploy leaders if I did that. And so for me, what I've decided is I went with the second option. Do the work that God's calling you to do and let God fill in the gaps. And so you've got to ask, has anyone ever asked you questions you don't know the answer to? Yes, and, he's an- and I have two outcomes when that happens. One, sometimes it's a supernatural moment and whoop, out comes something that God said. And it's not like a weird voice coming out of my mouth like I'm possessed. It's just, you know, I said something and I'm like, that was a little too good. (laughs) That was a little too smart, a little too clever, a little too, you know, spot on. It's a God thing. But those are more rare. Usually what happens is what I think is even better, as great as it is for the Holy Spirit to answer the question for you, What I think is even better is saying to someone, I don't know, but here's what I do know. I believe Jesus and the Holy Spirit has all the answers, and I want to go on a journey with you to discover what that answer is. And you teach someone how to go research and investigate the questions that they have about God. And so don't let your insecurity be an excuse not to follow the calling that God has for your life. This year, this fall, well, this month, I keep changing my dates, this month we're recruiting group leaders. Now, we've done some great work in the last year and a half in our groups department. And many of you have stepped up and hosted a group and created community and new people and some of the longtime Wilson Avenue people jumped on in. And you've been doing a great job of creating opportunities for fellowship and discipleship. But then about a third of you has just refused. And it perplexes me because you're great Christians. And the ones that perplex me specifically are the the longtime Wilson Avenue crowd. That says they care about fellowship, that says they care about discipleship, but doesn't get involved. And so my question to you today as we're wrestling with the calling, has God called you to lead a group and you refused? Has God called you to join a group? Some of you in this room have influence that I don't have. Some of you, if you would host a group, people would come back to church that left our church many years ago. Maybe they wouldn't come to the building, but they'd go to your house. And that's the beginning of something big happening in their life, to be reconciled to the community, the church, and God. And maybe you've come up with an excuse. Maybe you pretend it's pride and it's just not the way of the past and you want to go back to the old discipleship model. But maybe, just maybe, it's really insecurity. You're afraid you don't know how to host a small group. You're afraid of what people might say because you're used to Sunday school where it's all lecture-based and no one gets to talk. And now, if I sit in a circle and the night focuses on conversation, what if I don't know what to say? First of all, we will train you how to be an excellent group leader. You do not have to have a theological degree to be a group leader. And second, build community. Step up to the plate. Don't let excuses run. You know, the more groups we have, the more powerful our church is because the more deployed our church is ready. When our group's department is strong, we have a few things going on. One, we're building community. People are becoming friends with each other. And to be fully known is to be fully loved, right? It's not just about knowing your name and kind of what your kids are doing, but it's about being able to pray for you. Like what if every prayer request we just shared was a prayer request that was happening in your group? Was the victories that your group has been praying for and they could celebrate and they could throw parties? Having a tribe around you matters. And when you host a group, not only are you helping people grow in their faith, you're helping people talk it out in their life. I get to figure out what this actually means for me. What does it mean for me to be called? You get to talk about that and have discussions and learn. And we got a video curriculum set up that will be great. Or you can open a book. 
Or you can just open the Bible and do a Bible study that way. We've got many types of groups. In my dream, I would love to have every demographic in our church represented in our groups department. Last semester, I could tell you two big glaring gaps when I looked at the groups page. We were missing men's groups, and we were missing empty nesters, well, three, empty nesters, and we were missing senior groups. Not that we didn't have any, didn't have enough. And I looked at the room and I saw those three categories, the most displaced people in our church. And I know God's tugging on your heart today. On the card in a little bit, I'm going to give you an opportunity to check the box to go to groups training. You don't even have to be a group host. Just go to the training and see. Put the excuses aside for a moment and say, is God going to call me to build community in my church? And did you know having a group structure that's healthy and thriving allows those who are new to come into the church and become friends and to become known and to figure out that this is a church they want to do life at? The reality is, no matter how great the worship is, no matter how great the sermons might be, a person doesn't stay in a church long term because of the sermons that the pastor preaches or the worship. With the internet these days, we can get better sermons than Pastor Chris. I'm not the best in the country. With the internet these days, I don't have to hear the local band play. I can have the recording artist play it on loop, on Spotify. Why do people stay in a church? Because their friends are at that church. Because their tribe is at that church. And so if you're a guest here, don't hear me wrong. There are groups for you to get plugged into, and we're about to have a group's launch here early September that I want you to get plugged into. If you're a regular here, and you've been sitting this one out for a while, no matter what demographic you would make up, if it's a support group, a women's group, a young couple's group, whatever, jump in and let's create some community here and see what God does through you. Scripture clearly says where two or three are gathered, I am in there. I got worried you weren't going to answer me there, right? Again, look at yourself with Holy Spirit eyes. It's less about what you can do and more about what God wants to do through you. He wants you to gather in two or three plus so he can be in the midst of that community. Let's get involved. Okay, so Moses, he's going through his excuses, and he's like, I don't have the answer to every question, God. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then God kind of lets him know, hey, I'll give you the words to say. Don't worry about that. We'll give you the answers. And then Moses starts to lean into his next excuse. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. What if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? You see, now he's like, well, even if I do have the right answers, even if I do believe that you're the one who wants to work to me, what if they just don't listen to, the, to what I have? What if they don't want to follow me? And Moses, his next excuse is that he doesn't have enough influence. He doesn't have enough influence, and he's afraid that people won't respect him. You know why Moses is struggling with this idea of influence? Because he has a past. You see, Moses has a past. He murdered someone in Egypt. The reason he was out in the, in the wilderness, in the country, for our context, raising cattle and sheep, was that he was starting over, living off the grid, right? getting out of Dodge, hiding, because he was afraid what people would do and think of him if he stayed. And he's like, they're going to know what I did. They're not going to follow me because of my past. You must have the wrong guy. Who am I, God? I'm the bad guy that's like hiding out. Surely there's someone else. You know, your pastor has a past also. And I've been around people with a past. And here's what I love. I love when someone has a past. Don't get me wrong. I love everybody. But I've been around like the Christian that never had anything go wrong in their life, and that is a blessing. Don't hear me wrong. I'm so glad that you haven't had major tragedy break your life. But those who have had tragedy, a hurt, habit, or hang up, they've done something bad, something bad has happened to them, you're extra special. Not because of the badness that happened to you, 
but because God wants to use you in a unique way. God wants to heal you in a unique way, and he wants to use you in a unique way. You see, I have a background in recovery. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm a grateful believer that struggles with alcohol. That's what we say at a 12-step Christ-centered recovery. I also have a past marriage where my ex-wife ran off with another guy and had a kid. So I have a divorce in my past. And I could easily stand here and be like, God, you want me to be a pastor. You want me to lead a group of people. I can easily say, God, they won't listen to me. My past is broken and it's got pain. Why should they keep coming to me? Why should they credit me with anything? I could easily fall into that trap. And it's tempting. Sometimes I don't even want to say it on the stage because if I don't have enough time to unpack it, I'm afraid of what you'll think. Worst case scenario. But here's what I've learned. The more I share my story, the more I share that, the more relatable I am to other people. And not just the more relatable I am to other people, the more relatable Jesus is to them. I get to share the story about how God put my life back together piece by piece. How God forgave and healed and worked through the brokenness that happened in my life. And I actually look at your past as not a bad thing, not something to hold you back, but something to propel you forward. If you have a past, you've got a secret weapon because your past helps you push the mission of Jesus further and faster because the world is full of broken and hurting people that need to know that Jesus loves them and cares for them and has a future with them. And it don't matter what hurt, what brokenness you've experienced in your life, God wants to use that to help others find freedom and victory in his name. And so don't fall into the excuse that Moses had where he looked at his past and thought, too much. They won't trust me. God goes on, I mean, Moses goes on, Yet with another excuse, Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses raised another objection. Master, please, I really don't talk well. I've never been good with words, neither before nor after you spoke to me. I I stutter and stammer. And what Moses was struggling here was with the excuse of inadequacy. He felt, I'm not good enough at and in fill in the blank. We've all been there. We've all felt like we're not good enough at something. And so we're like, God, you can't be calling me to this because I'm not good enough. Moses is like, I can't talk to the king. I'm not good enough at speech. I can't lead the crowd to tell the nation to follow me. I'm not great at leadership talk. I stutter, I stammer. Why would people want to listen to me? And maybe yours wasn't about speech, but maybe yours was about something else. Maybe you were like, I don't know the Bible good enough. I'm not a great speaker, like communicator. Maybe I'm just not a good leader. I've no, I don't know. I, I work a blue-collar job. I've never led a crowd in my life. How could I lead this ministry department? Or maybe you just feel like you don't have enough time. Or maybe you're like, I don't have enough energy. Or maybe you're like, my husband or wife would never go for that. And so you use that inadequacy as an excuse to opt out of the calling that God has put on your life. Check out God's response to our inadequacy. Verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Now some might think, This is what Pastor Chris was talking about, right? Where, like, God gives you the words to speak? Well, yeah, I guess, maybe. But look closer, because often we misread this. Well, we scan over this verse too quick. Put it back up for a moment. I will be with your mouth. I will be with your mouth. The inadequacy. He felt not good enough when it came to his speech. And what God is showing us here, when he calls us to something, God's not just with you in a broad sense. He also leans in a special way to where you feel your shortcoming is. And Moses felt it in his mouth. And God said, I will be extra there for you. 
don't worry. I'm leaning in. I'm not just with you. I'm with you in every area, especially where you feel inadequate. And that's true for you today. No matter what excuse you have, when God's calling you to do something, he's leaning in and says, I'll be a little bit extra there in that spot, in that fear that you have of being inadequate in that way. I'll be there for you. I wish I could tell you that you can feel equipped enough to do this on your own. Like there's that temptation that I was saying earlier that it feels like maybe I should just lock myself in the office and try to get equipped. And maybe some of you have felt that way on your own. You're like, man, I'd love to do what God's calling me to do, but I've got to get more experience under my belt. I've got to get more equipped to go and do this. And you know what's funny is we will allow that feeling of lack of equipped, the insecurity of inadequacy to rule over the calling that God has put on our life. But that doesn't stop us in other areas. Like when I married Stephanie, they gave me a marriage certificate. And just because they gave me a marriage certificate did not mean that I knew how to be a husband, right? But it didn't stop me from pursuing her. I'm still learning how to be a husband. I'm sure, Pastor George, after 50 years, you're still learning how to be a husband, right? Yes, because time changes. People change over time, and your season of life changes. And what you face today as a couple is different than what you'll face tomorrow as a couple. And you'll never really have it all figured out. And the truth is, if you try to wait until you feel equipped enough, you're going to wait until the time that Jesus comes back. And so don't hit pause until you feel equipped enough. Sure, continue to educate yourself, continue to grow, and then go live on mission for Jesus. You know, just this week, I was in Savannah, Georgia, and anytime a pastor gets to go on a trip, then you get to hear about it in the sermon, because it's like, what well, God's connecting all the things in my mind as I'm studying the sermon. And I'm going to share a story that I didn't want to share with you, because I kind of struggle with this, this robbing. Like, I don't want to be prideful about me stepping out in faith and doing good in someone's life. Like, I'm not doing this for a pat on my back but I think it's an educational moment for all of us. Did you know the pastor sometimes feels inadequate to go do the simplest Jesus task? I was in Savannah. It's our 10-year anniversary trip. You know, we don't live it up like that all the time, but it's our anniversary trip. And Stephanie and I are foodies, and we like to eat, okay? And so we're going from restaurant to restaurant. We'll try the tacos here. You know, we'll try the desserts over here we'll go over here for the fried chicken there and we're just kind of doing a restaurant crawl for the whole week I probably gained 10 pounds this week just eating like crazy one of the stops that we stopped in was at birds cookies has anyone know what birds cookies are some do you do okay it's a cookie shop and they give you unlimited samples of cookies that are like this big super dangerous And they know what they're doing. They're getting that sugar rush going. They're getting you high on sugar, and you're not making the best decisions. It's our anniversary trip, so we're like, what budget? Let's go. Don't say Dave Ramsey's name for the next two weeks while we try to recover from this financial meltdown that we're going through. (laughs) And we spent probably about $70 on cookies. (laughs) On cookies. And so here we are with $70 of cookies, And then when you go shopping, if you're a gentleman, you carry the bags and you let the woman roam to the next shop, right? And so I'm just as guilty. The cookies was not just on her. My hand's, you know, just as guilty as hers. But I'm carrying the bags of cookies. And we turn the corner, and I think the pizza place's name was Dino's. It's like in this cute courtyard area. There's restaurants and gift shops and candy stores, and everybody's kind of in here. But it's hot. Where is August? early August in Savannah, Georgia. It's like Mobile with a little less humidity. I told them to stop crying about it out there. You don't know what humidity is like. (laughs) Come visit us in Mobile. (laughs) So everyone's eating pizza, but because it's hot, they're all against the building under the little shade that the overhangs are giving them. And there's a crowd of people eating pizza. And Stephanie has to walk away and use the restroom. And so I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, that pizza must be good because everyone's eating it how do I get me a slice? 
And I'm full, like I'm going to puke full, but I'm still thinking like a fat kid wanting the next food. And I mean, every, I notice everybody's watching something. And so I look over to see what they're watching. And there's this guy who's digging in the trash can in the middle of the courtyard, pulling old slices of pizza out in 90 degree weather, soggy, slimy, probably bacteria infested pizza. He's eating it. My first logical thought was, that's hunger. <laughs> you know, hunger is where you just don't care because you need it that bad. Then my second thought was, I wonder the last time that guy felt seen in a good way. Because everyone sees him right now, and everyone's judging him, and no one's doing anything. And we're in the South. Y'all are supposed to be Christians down here. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Pot calling the kettle black because I'm the pastor, paid professional Christian standing here. I got to do something. So I put the cookies down, told those cookies, now don't you go anywhere, I love you, I'll be back for you. <laughs> and I walked over to this young guy and said, hey, are you hungry? I'll buy you something to eat. And since he was eating pizza, I'm like, how about we get you a good pizza? And so we're in line, there's quite a big line because it's a famous pizza joint. And I wish I could tell you, man, I presented the gospel so eloquently. We had great conversation. He had a life-altering decision. No, it was super awkward. Super awkward talking about life, talking about his situation. I could only help so much. In my like, heart, I'm codependent, so I want to fix everything, you know? And so I can't because he lives here in Savannah, and I live down in Mobile, and I don't have the resources to help a guy like that, but I could buy him lunch. And so I'm talking to him, and he's telling me about how his mom and sister is back home, and they really can't get out for one reason or another. They're sick and bedridden or whatever. And so I don't buy him a slice. I buy him a large pizza and a gift card because I said, you know what? I want you to eat well. I want you to bring this pizza home to your sister and your mom to eat, and I want you to take this gift card and come back a few more times this week and eat while we ordered the pizza. And then he disappeared for a moment. I was like, man, did I just spend a bunch of money on a guy who didn't even stick around for the pizza? And so I sat there and I was waiting, like, where did he go? And he came back, thankfully. And I was like, well, you know, I'm just going to watch make sure he eats that pizza. Because I, I did my part. I fed the guy who was eating in the trash. And God was, like, tugging on my heart saying, that's not good enough. That's not enough. I'm like, God, it was already awkward once. I just want to hold my cookies and go on to the next shop. <laughs> And God's like, I've blessed you so much that you just dropped $70 on cookies and didn't even think about it. You could spend a little time and a little money with this guy. And so I went back over and I'm like, what's your name? And he's like, oh, my name's Frederick. I could say that because he's a state away. He's like, my name's Frederick. And I'm like, Frederick, I just want you to know, like, do you believe in Jesus or not? And why not we had a little bit of convo on that? And I was like, you know, regardless of where you're at in your faith, I saw you, and God sees you, and I think you have value, and I know God thinks you have value. And life doesn't have to be this way, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but get plugged in with a local church, because a local church will want to help you get back up on your feet. And if that local church doesn't want to help you, go to the next, because that's an unbiblical church. Get to a local church that wants to help you get back up on your feet. And I prayed with him, and he went his way. And funny enough, because we shared names with each other, his mom messaged me on Facebook and said, thank you. I've been telling Frederick for a while that God has not forgotten us. Super awkward moment. I wish I could tell you it was like the best Jesus experience of my life. The whole time I'm like, this is a train wreck. The conversation's a train wreck. I don't have the right things to say. I'm not very interesting right now. I don't know if it's the heat, the full belly, the, the guilt. I don't know what it is. And in my prayer, when I prayed for him, I'm a short prayer person. Some of you are great at prayers. I'm like, Jesus loves you. Be with them. Amen. <laughs> like, and I believe God hears both. You know, God reads our heart. He knows what I'm trying to communicate. And so I'm trying to pray for this guy. And I just like, man, I am rambling. <laughs> Let's, let's land this plane and move on with this prayer. But it didn't matter if it was awkward. What matters is that I did what God called me to do. 
I fulfilled the calling in that moment that he called me to do, which was to feed that guy and let him know he's seen and loved. And God is at work in the background. If he ever believes or not in God and Jesus, at least he knows there's someone out there that sees value in him. And so don't let your inadequacy hold you back from what God wants to do in your life. Don't let your inadequacy hold you back from the calling, from the tug, from God telling you to take that next step. The fifth excuse that Moses gives is the excuse of being irrational. And it's actually the excuse that God gets grumpy with Moses at. He's like, you know, I know you've walked through it with me on all this drama, and you kind of unpacked all these excuses I have, but even though you could overcome everything, I just want you to use someone else. Just choose someone else. I don't want to do it. And he basically said that in verse 13 in your well, it's not in your outline, but it'll be on the screen. He's like, just pick someone else. And God gets grumpy. And I think he gets grumpy at him because the calling, sometimes it's not optional. And if we're going to sit here and say, God of the universe is perfect. God of the universe is the smartest being that has ever existed. And knows what he's doing. And never makes a mistake If we're going to say that, if we're going to say that he's the most wise being to have ever existed, then who are we to question him picking you? Because obviously he hasn't made a mistake. You know, Moses saying this is like us saying to God, God, there are seven billion other people on the planet. Go pick someone else. It's like us saying to God, God, at Wilson Avenue, at any given week, in the summer, there's like 200 people at Wilson Avenue. In the fall, in the spring, there's like 300 people at Wilson Avenue. Go use one of them. Don't use me. Don't, don't use me, God. God, I don't want to host a group. Go use one of those other people. Sure, there's no seniors group. Sure, there's no empty nesters group. Sure, there's no men's group. Go use one of the other fellas, not me. Go ahead, go. Go use them. And if God's been tugging at your heart, he's called you. He's not calling them. He's called them to something else. This calling is specifically for you. Here's your last fill-in in your outline. When God is with you, your excuses are worthless. When God is with you, your excuses are worthless. Because God's bigger than your excuses. Your excuses are nothing to God. Here's the thing. God's not afraid of your excuses. And even though you might feel a little bit reluctable, God's not afraid of that also. And if you think the biggest leaders, the best leaders that have ever existed, like we're always leaders, you're fooling yourself. Let's say Billy Graham. Amazing leader, right? How many of us think Billy Graham was amazing? Some of you guys did, right? His sermons still give me goosebumps when I listen to them online. They're great. Thousands of people, probably millions of people, will be in heaven because of the words that he spoke. But at one point in history, he was a nobody. He wasn't always a great leader and pastor. At some point, he was a nobody. Some of the greatest leaders at some point were nobodies. And that's also in Scripture. And so don't think, that, oh, God can't, doesn't want to do something big with me because I'm just a nobody. No, that's exactly who God wants to do something big in. Because when we have a past, when we're nobodies, when we have all these insecurities, when we have all these shortcomings, then we can be like Paul, where he says in Philippians 4, 13, where he looks at his ministry and says, I can do all this in Christ who gives me strength. Where we go, I can do all this regardless of my past, regardless of my insecurities, regardless of my excuses, through Christ who gives me strength. Even more, this means I get to proclaim the news of the Jesus because this should stop me, and it doesn't. It propels me forward to push the mission forward. Two more stories. I'm going to close up. I'm not going to read the verses. You could read it in Exodus 4 this week. But God tells Moses, hey, Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses is standing there. At this point, he's a shepherd tending the sheep, right? So he has a staff. It looks like a big wooden stick shaped like a candy cane. And so Moses is like, it's a staff, Lord. And God's like, okay, throw that on the ground. 
Now, the staff represented wealth. It represented a job. It represented income. And Moses knew that he had that because God blessed him with it. God gave him that opportunity to be a shepherd. God gave him that career. God gave him that skill set. And God's like, throw it on the ground, which represents trust me with it, Moses. I blessed you. Now, will you trust me with it? And so Moses throws the staff on the ground. And immediately God changes that stick to a snake, to a serpent. Now we hear that and we think water moccasin run, right? But in their day, a snake represented power and healing. What was just a stick in man's hand becomes alive in God's hands. God's blessed you with everything you have, your job, your career, your family, your health. Don't hold it back your time. Don't hold it back to yourself. Live open-handed with it and see how God could double down on that blessing by bringing it to life over and over and over again. God teaches this to Moses one other time in that conversation. God's like, hey, Moses, take that hand, hand representing I can have a job. Maybe you haven't valued your hands lately, but without these things, it'd be really hard to have a career. You could dig ditches with these hands. You could type on computers and make programs with these hands. You could do all kinds of things. You can be a teacher writing on a whiteboard with these hands. Hands are priceless tools that God gave us. And if you're missing a hand, or I'm not saying that you can't do things, it's just obviously easier if you have hands. It's beneficial to have hands. And God's like, Moses, what's it? You see that hand of yours representing a career, an ability to earn income, a blessing from God that he has a hand. He's like, stick that hand in your cloak. So Moses does that. And God's okay, pull that hand out. And he pulls the hand out. And Moses freaks out because his hand has leprosy on it. It's white and got sores and it's pussy and it's nasty. And at that day and age, you had to go into quarantine if you got that disease. You had to go live outside of town with all the other lepers, and you're probably going to die of leprosy. It's not going to go away. And Moses is like, I thought you were calling me to do some miracle, and now I have leprosy. I think what God's trying to teach us in this moment is sometimes we take all the blessings that he gives us, and again, we hoard it to ourselves. And because of that, our life is a little sick. Your life is a little sick. Like you feel a little bit more anxious than you used to in life. You feel a little bit more discontent than you used to in life. Your marriage and your family feels like something's just missing. Is it possible that your life is a little sick because you've held back from God? And instead of sharing the blessing with God and allow him to work and do incredible things in your life and make those blessings come alive yet again in your life, You've chosen a life of a little bit of spiritual sickness. Closing up right now. Here, here we go. He says, okay, Moses, put that hand back in your cloak. And he does. And then he uses a different word this time. He says, go there forth. Anytime God says that, it's kind of like your mission, your calling in life. Go there forth and pull out your hand again. And he pulls it out and the hand's restored and it's healthy. What's in your hand? What's holding you back? What's holding you back from being involved in our group's department? What's holding you back from joining a group or leading a group? What's holding, you've been blessed with a, with a personality. You've been blessed with a voice. You've been blessed with friendships. Some of you got friends and you're like, I don't need to join a group. I got friends in the church. Well, yeah, but you're robbing other people of friendship. Yeah, you're robbing other people of what God wants to do through you. What's holding you back from joining a ministry team? What's holding you back from being on a greeters or kids ministry? The fall comes and the new people start coming in who need to hear the gospel and life transformation will start to pick up and we want to be ready for that season. What's holding you back from God using you? What's holding you back from God using you to minister to the families on your street, to the person in your office, to the family member that you have that you know is not in a good spot? What's holding you back? What blessing has God given you that you've held on to? Whether it be your time, your energy, your health, your finances, your influence, what, is, what are you holding on to? And is your life a little sickly because you've held on to it for too long? 
God's telling you he wants to redeem it. God's showing us he wants to bring it back to life. Trust God. And here's the deal. There's a ripple effect when we start living for Jesus. It doesn't just happen with me and one other person, but that other person goes and lives for Jesus, and then that other person goes and lives for Jesus, and it's like throwing a rock in the pond. Boop, and you see all the ripples spread out, and eventually the ripples hit every edge of that pond. And you never really know how far God will work through you until we get to heaven. Watch this, because it explains it clearly. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James, who was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. That's a great example of the life that Jesus is calling us to. Would you pray with me?